Hello, I am Doug Beaumont, the Director of Religious Education for St. Joseph's Catholic Church. We are discussing the problem of evil, and last time we had a look at the metaphysical argument, which was basically that it seems like if God made everything and evil is real, then God made evil, and therefore he is responsible for it. And what we saw was that evil is always a privation. It's always something missing from the good. And so if God allows that for good reasons, he is not directly blamable for it in the way he would be if he simply created the evil out of nothing. Today, we're going to look at the logical problem of evil, that an all-powerful, all-good God can exist in the same world that is so full of evil. Now, the logical problem of evil is probably the most important of the intellectual versions of the problem of evil. And basically what it's saying is that if an all-good, all-powerful God exists, then it doesn't seem like evil should exist, but evil definitely exists, therefore God doesn't exist. Now, that's a very oversimplified version of the argument, and I don't want you to think that I'm just dealing with overly simplistic versions. So we are going to look at the argument from the point of view of a skeptical scholar. Dr. Sally Hasslinger is a professor of philosophy at MIT. And she put together this little illustrated version of the problem of evil from a philosophical, logical point of view. I'm going to put a link to that video in the description, so if you want to go watch it yourself, go ahead and click on it, watch it, and then come back here when you're done. Otherwise, you can just look at this little summary that I put together from her presentation. So Dr. Hasslinger says, number one, if God exists, then he, she, or it would be ooh. Okay, now this is a little goofy, but O-O-O, which she pronounces O, stands for omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Now, omniscient means all-knowing. It means that God is not unaware of anything that's happening. Omnipotent means that God is all-powerful. And omnibenevolent means that he is all-good or all-loving. And Dr. Hasslinger is going to argue that a God like that cannot possibly allow evil. This comes up in the second part of the argument, where Dr. Hasslinger says this, If an ooh being exists, then there would be no evil. Now, premise two is actually the conclusion to another argument that she kind of calls out to the side. Let's have a look at that. She says, first of all, an all-knowing being, or an omniscient being, would know where there will be evil. So, evil doesn't exist because God just isn't aware of it and would stop it if he knew about it. It exists and God knows about it. Next, she says an all-powerful being could prevent the evil from happening if it tried. Okay, this seems pretty intuitive. If God is all-powerful, he can do anything, so he could stop evil if he wanted to. Third, an all-good being would try to prevent evil, therefore there would be no evil. But then she does a little thought experiment and says, okay, let's suppose Christians are right and God exists. Then there wouldn't be any evil. But the problem is evil does exist and therefore an ooh God does not. So Dr. Haslinger says, the conclusion is this, the theist, the person who believes in an ooh God only has three choices. They can deny that there's evil, which is not open to the Christian. They can give up at least one of the ooh features, which is also not open to the Christian, or to good philosophy in general, or they can be irrational. In other words, if this argument proves that an ooh being can't exist in a world that has evil, then you either have to give up evil or give up God. That's really the only two ways to go, unless you just want to be irrational. Now, one of the things that I liked about Dr. Haslinger's presentation is that she's smart enough to realize that there are some pretty big assumptions going on in this argument, and she lists two of them out. The first one is that an all-good thing always eliminates evil as far as it can. And the second assumption is that there are no limits to what an omnipotent thing can do. The problem behind this whole argument is not that it isn't logical. The problem is that the assumptions behind that valid argument are both false. Now we're going to unpack this as we go along, but just to give you a quick preview, consider the all good father that we talked about earlier. Let's just say that there was a dad out there that was a perfect dad, an all good dad. Is it the case that that dad would always eliminate evil in the lives of his children? 
No. Would a good father let his kids sit around and eat sugar all day long and not suffer through eating a vegetable? No, that wouldn't be a good dad at all. There are things in life that require suffering to attain. Sometimes the kid has to touch the hot stove to learn about why you don't touch a hot stove. Sometimes a kid has to be punished to learn that there are consequences to actions. So we have firsthand experience that being a good thing does not always mean eliminating all evil or suffering. The second assumption is that an omnipotent being is unlimited in what it can do. But that's not true. First of all, there are simple logical impossibilities. No matter how powerful God is, he can't make a married bachelor. He can't make a square circle. There are certain things that simply cannot exist, not because there's a lack of power in God the Creator, but because they are literal impossibilities. Not just practical impossibilities, but actual logical impossibilities. The very nature of existence excludes certain things from being able to exist. And God can't create those no matter how much power he has, because power is the ability to affect change. It's not the ability to make nonsense suddenly become sense. And further, if God is an ooh being, then not only is he all powerful, but he's also all good. And what that means is that he cannot use his power in an evil way. So this idea that God's omnipotence just takes all the limits off of what can happen in the world is false. So both of those assumptions are false. And without those assumptions, as we'll see, the rest of the argument doesn't do very well. So moving forward with the logical argument against God. Well, there's two different kinds of evil that we need to consider. One of them is natural evil, bad things that happen in the course of nature. A landslide kills somebody. An earthquake destroys a city. A flood wipes out an entire village. These kinds of things are just part of nature. But there's also moral evil. And moral evil is evil that actual persons choose to commit. And it's important that we keep in mind that these are two different kinds of evil when we are dealing with the logical problem of evil. Because the reasons God might allow for nature to run its course may be very different than the reason he allows evil people to continue existing and affecting the world. Before we get into why God might allow moral evil, it's important to note that the very existence of evil, the very fact that we can identify it and that it bothers us, is itself kind of an argument for the existence of God. And I'm going to rely on C.S. Lewis here, whose book Mere Christianity is probably the greatest defense of the Christian faith written in the 20th century. Now, C.S. Lewis wasn't always a believer, but part of his conversion into Christianity was actually based on the existence of evil. He says, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, C.S. Lewis had an amazing epiphany here. He looked around at the universe. He saw that there was a whole bunch of stuff about it that seemed wrong. Not just that he didn't like, but that was actually wrong. But for something to be wrong, there has to be a right. There has to be a standard that you can compare it to to see that there's something wrong. And the difficulty with looking at the whole universe is that there's no standard outside the universe to judge the universe on. So if there's no God, if there's nothing outside the universe, then calling something in the universe evil is irrational. For example, the fact that I don't like the taste of cauliflower isn't evil, it's just something I don't happen to like. Why? Because cauliflower is just cauliflower and my taste buds are just taste buds. That's just how the world works. But of course, Earthquakes and floods and landslides are just how the universe works as well. So why is it that when nature takes its course and kills a bunch of people, we don't treat that the same way that we treat our distaste for certain foods? It's because we say that shouldn't be that way. It's wrong that that happened. But all of those words imply that some standard of goodness has been violated but if the universe is all there is, then the universe is the standard, and then anything that happens must be okay, because the universe would be all there is. And what C.S. Lewis realized was, no, the fact that I can tell that some things are just a matter of taste and some things are a matter of actual right and wrong means that 
outside the universe, there must be some standard of goodness that's being violated. And he realized that would have to be God. Okay, so moving on to certain formulations of the logical problem of evil. The philosopher Alvin Plantinga is often credited with basically solving the logical problem of evil. And this is how he did it. He said that the problem of evil comes when we say that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good, and yet there is evil in the world. But then he stops right there and says, hold on a minute, that's not enough. In order to prove that those premises don't go together, you need another one. In other words, you need to make a certain assumption explicit and put it in the argument to make it valid. And that assumption is this. There is no sufficient reason for evil. Now remember, this is the logical problem of evil. All we need is one sufficient reason for God to allow evil. And even if it's wrong, the logical problem of evil goes away. And he offers us one. Plantinga says that the good that results from free will is a morally sufficient reason to allow evil. We have to have freedom in order to be morally good. We don't praise rocks for doing what they're supposed to do. The whole idea of reward and punishment is based on the idea that we have the freedom to choose or not choose good things. So for God to have free creatures capable of moral good, he has to allow them to be free, which means he has to allow them to potentially choose moral evil. Now, we don't have to agree with Plantiga, but the very fact that it could be the case means that we don't have to be irrational to believe that an all-good, all-powerful God allows evil, because there is at least a potential reason for God to do so. Another philosopher by the name of John Hick said that the morally sufficient reason for God to allow evil is that in order for certain moral goods, like virtue, to grow in a person, they have to be in a world where some evil exists. And the idea here is that there are certain virtues that just can't come into existence without something bad out there for them to operate against. So for example, think of courage. How could someone ever learn courage, be a courageous person, if there was no threat that anything bad could ever happen to them? It doesn't take courage to go into a situation where you know nothing could possibly go wrong. And so to develop courage, there has to be things to be legitimately afraid of. You know, you can kind of think of your soul like the muscles of your body. If there isn't something heavy to lift, something to push against those muscles, they can never grow. And what John Hicks says is that God has allowed a certain amount of evil in this world for the development of virtue, which ultimately is necessary to be good human beings. And that the withholding of all evil would make it impossible for us to achieve those goods. Now again, you don't have to agree that any of this is why God allows evil. But the fact that logically it is still coherent to believe in an all-good, all-powerful God who allows evil is reintroduced when we have morally sufficient reasons for him to do so, and I've just given you two really good ones. Now, when dealing with the natural problem of evil, there's a couple different things we can say here as well. God is a God of order. We know that from scripture, and we know that from looking at his creation. If creation didn't operate according to regular laws, we would lose our ability to freely choose because we would never know what the consequences of our actions would be. I mean, imagine if sometimes slapping somebody really hurt them, and sometimes it made them feel really good. How would you ever make a moral decision about whether or not to slap somebody? We need regular natural laws in order to have our freedom. Another issue is that this is a finite, limited universe, and in order to keep it regular, certain things have to obtain pretty much all the time. The same gravity that keeps us from flying off into space pulls rocks down on top of us. The same fire that cooks animal meat for us to eat safely will cook our meat <laughs> if we accidentally come in contact with it. The same sun that melts wax can also harden clay. It goes on and on and on. In order to have a universe of regular laws that we can operate in, God can't just be constantly changing the rules or making certain foreseen circumstances not take place. Otherwise, we would literally live in a world of chaos. Now, all of this is getting us pretty close to a solution to the logical 
problem of evil. However, there is an additional step that you might have thought of already, or that you probably will if you think about this for very long. And this is the problem of the amount of evil. Philosopher William Rowe says, you know, some suffering could be prevented without losing the greater good, so why doesn't God lessen it? The problem is that if we take this argument to its logical conclusion, we're basically right back to eliminating evil completely again. Because you can always say one more, one more, one more. What if you get down to one? Just one murder is unacceptable in a perfect world. Just one earthquake is unacceptable in a perfect world. And the problem is that God may already be causing a lot of evil to not occur, and we don't know it because it just doesn't occur. But once we start trying to quantify how much evil is allowable and how much isn't, we run into very serious difficulties. An analogy that might help us see this is insect termination. One insect exterminator killing all the bugs in one house is a convenience. But if there was an infinite insect exterminator that got rid of all the bugs on the entire planet, that would be catastrophic. And so the problem with these analogies between the good father and the good God, or the good policeman and the good God, or the good whatever and the good God, is that we're comparing a finite creature that has a limited range of effects with an infinite God whose range of effects could be total. Every individual police officer should attempt to stop every single crime that they see happening. If God were to wipe out all crime, the only way he could do it would be by wiping out freedom. And that itself would be a great evil. Okay, I've given you some good starter points for dealing with the logical problem of evil. What we have seen is that it is not irrational to believe in an all good, all perfect God who allows evil because there are, at least potentially, some good reasons to do so. But next time we're gonna talk about the ultimate reason that God may have for allowing evil. And this is where Christianity's contribution to the thought process becomes very important. All right, I'm Douglas Beaumont, the Director of Religious Education for St. Joseph's Catholic Church. If this video has been helpful to you, would you click that like button and make sure to subscribe to the channel and click that bell notification so that you'll know when the next video comes out. Till next time, God bless. Mm -hmm.